Hello, and welcome virtually to the Sonata Patient event with Dr. Louie. My name is Teresa. I'm the nurse advocate and educator for Sonata. Um, this event is meant to be interactive, so any questions you have, you can put them in the chat and we'll address them at the end of the, the talk. Um, we are lucky to have Dr. Louie joining us this evening. Um, Dr. Louie, let's talk a little bit about yourself and let's talk fibroids. All right. Thanks, Teresa. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, I am really excited to be here to talk to you about my favorite topic, which is fibroids and what to do about them. Um, just a little bit about myself. I am one of the um, surgeons at Mayo Clinic in the gynecology department, and I'm the head of the fibroid center there. I did an OBGYN residency at McGee Women's Hospital in Pittsburgh. I'm originally from New York, so I'm an East Coast gal, and then did my fellowship uh, at UNC in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I was on faculty at UNC for several years and then moved out to Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona, and I've been here for about three years. Um, I was brought out here to start the Fibroid Center, and I'm really proud of what we've been able to develop and offer for people in this area. One of those technologies that I was able to bring to the Mayo Clinic was the transcervical radio frequency fibroid system, or Sonata, as we'll call it tonight. And um, I'm really happy to share that experience with you all. Um, Teresa, do you have any other business to discuss with our attendees before I jump right in? No, just jump right in. All right, thank you. Well, as Teresa and Casey said, this is supposed to be interactive. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We do have plenty of time for questions at the end. We have about 30 minutes of material and then about 30 minutes reserved for questions. So certainly if you'd like to share your story or any questions that you might have, concerns, um, please do bring them up today. Um, as far as disclosures, I am a consultant for Gynasonics, which means I'm paid. However, all of the slides and uh, material that we'll present today are, you know, developed by myself. So, um, you know, I, I wasn't um, given any of these materials to present to you all tonight. So really what I'm presenting to you is my personal experience with this system. Um, it does not reflect the, necessarily the views of Mayo Clinic, and it's supposed to be for informational purposes. Um, before we jump right into all the material, I did want to share with you a patient story. Um, this uh, is, um, you know, really representative of a lot of patients that I see, and I just thought it was a really impactful way to start off our evening. So while we're getting this started, please feel free to grab something to eat, grab something to drink. This is um, supposed to be, you know, casual and relaxed um, and just, you know, enjoy uh, some of the information. about having an embarrassing incident or you really just don't feel confident, you limit yourself, you isolate yourself. Do I need an extra change of clothes? What am I really gonna be doing today? Um, maybe I won't even do that today. Maybe I'll do that um, in a couple weeks. My symptoms got so bad that um, I would have to really plan out where and I was going to leave my house. There was almost like no flow. Like I was, I was thinking, all right, like maybe this will be something that I won't even have to worry about. And that's exactly what happened. I kind of, I don't even think about my periods anymore. If they happen, I'm like, oh, okay. Cause they're usually only a couple days and they're very light. My life today is, is wonderful. And it's all about my children and my family and friends and, and living the life that I always wanted to live without really thinking about my period. All right, well, um, that is, uh, again, Jackie's story. Uh, it's representative of many patients that I see day to day. And, um, you know, what I think is really impactful about Jackie's story is not only, you know, who feels that way, you know, I feel like um, I hear, Patients tell me that all the time, that they have to plan their life around their period. They have to bring an extra pair of clothes to work. Um, they're not sure if they should go out to dinner that night, you know, because they're expecting their period to come any moment. Um, and it's really just 
their entire lives become about planning um, around their period. Um, what I think is really interesting also about Jackie's story is that um, she was uh, treated in 2016 and that interview was done in 2020. So that interview was done four years later, not a week after her surgery and not a month after her surgery, but four years later, she is still feeling like the impact from that um, you know, is is giving her benefit to that day. So we'll go into some of the results about what to expect after that treatment and how durable it is. Uh, but I really um, thought that her story was representative of a lot of people that we see and maybe some of you who are here tonight. Um, so this is a safe place. Um, I also wanted to take this moment to say, you know, we are going to talk about some sensitive stuff, you know, periods and pain. And, you know, some people might find that embarrassing, but as a gynecologist, that's my everyday. So you'll never ask me a question or tell me something that I have not heard before. Um, this is a safe place where it is very, very normal to talk about your periods and it is okay to feel frustrated or annoyed or to have whatever emotions you would like to have. Um, this is a brave space. And so feel free to share with others who are here tonight. Um, and, you know, there's no judgment here. This is a place where it's normal to talk about these very personal things. Um, but it is not normal to feel like you have to plan your life around your period. So that's why we're here today is talking about uh, a very common source for period issues, which is uterine fibroids, how they're diagnosed, um, some treatment options for them, and in particular, Sonata as a treatment option, and how you decide which is the right treatment for you. Um, to start off, uh, just to make sure that everyone has the same bit of information, uterine fibroids are benign or non-cancerous growths in the muscle portion of the uterus. So you can see in this picture here, we have the body of the uterus, the cervix, which is the opening to the uterus, and then we have the ovaries and fallopian tubes on each side. The fibroid is depicted here, growing within the muscle portion of the uterus, and you can see that um, right here. Uh, these fibroids are thought to be hormonally responsive, um, which means that they tend to grow in response to estrogen, um, and that's why they tend to occur during those reproductive years of our lives. Fibroids can be located in various different parts of the uterus, and that's really what dictates a lot of the symptoms they might cause and a lot of the treatments that we have available. So your doctors might talk to you about submucosal fibroids, which are fibroids that grow within the cavity of the uterus. So that's those fibroids here. These are the ones that are most likely to cause bleeding symptoms because our period comes from the lining of the uterus, which is called the endometrium, which is this light peach color here. So fibroids that are close to or pushing into the cavity tend to cause more bleeding issues. Intramural fibroids are fibroids within the wall of the uterus. And so that's like this guy here. So it means that it doesn't really push into the cavity and it doesn't really push out of the surface of the uterus, but it's within that muscle portion completely. Subserosal fibroids are located on the surface of the uterus. And so that would be like this guy over here or this guy down here, where you can actually see the fibroid push out from the surface um, and that can cause more bulk symptoms. So symptoms where the fibroids are actually compressing or pushing on the stuff around them. So very common symptoms of fibroids include period issues, again, fibroids that are closer to the inside portion of the womb, pregnancy complication like miscarriage or issues with the placenta or fetal growth, and thus again, fibroids closer to the inside portion of the uterus. Fibroids that are more pushing on the outside tend to compress the stuff around them, and that's when people can feel urinary issues like frequency, urgency, or leakage, and have difficulty passing bowel movements. When fibroids get big enough, you can even feel them in your body. So some people tell me, I can feel like my pants don't fit anymore. I can't button my pants like I used to, or I actually feel this hardness around my abdomen. And that's, you're feeling the fibroid themselves as they get big enough. Uh, as we talked about, fibroids are responsive to estrogen. So usually they show up in our reproductive years, meaning after we go through puberty, and they tend to be not as um, prominent after we go through menopause but they are extremely common. So if you have 10 girlfriends, seven to eight of them have fibroids. It is only two or three of your 10 friends 
who do not have fibroids by the time you're 50 years old. So it's actually more normal to have fibroids than to not have fibroids. So it doesn't make you crazy or strange to have them, but that doesn't mean that they're normal in the sense that they don't cause any issues. Certainly they do. They cause those period issues and they can cause other, you know, symptoms from pushing on the stuff around them. But only about 50% of people actually have those problems. So it is actually possible to have fibroids and to not have symptoms from them. It doesn't necessarily mean you don't need or shouldn't want treatment. It just means that if you're diagnosed with fibroids, it might just be because you had an exam or had an ultrasound for another reason and the fibroids were found by accident. And that's not unusual because, again, 50% or half of the cases we see actually show up that way. Uh, there are certain risk factors for fibroids. So some people say, you know, why me? And unfortunately, it has a lot to do with our family history, stuff that we don't have control over. So things like our genetics. We do know women of African descent are particularly more vulnerable to fibroids, having larger, more numerous fibroids and more severe symptoms. And then some certain health conditions can also make it more likely for you to develop fibroids. High blood pressure, having high sugar or diabetes, and carrying more weight are also associated with fibroid growth. And there are some studies that some elements of our diet and our lifestyle, so things like exercise decrease fibroid growth, and then certain foods might increase fibroid growth. So a lot of people say, are there any natural ways that I can deal with fibroids? And really the best evidence is to eat a healthy diet full of fruits and vegetables and less of the red meat and less alcohol and less processed food. So more of that natural Mediterranean diet is, is best for fibroid growth. And really the whole, you know, sort of thing about um, having fibroid symptoms or having a fibroid diagnosis is I want to encourage people to be an advocate for themselves is don't wait until it gets to a point where you're missing work, you're missing school, you aren't able to do the things you want to do, right? If you think your period is heavy, then it's heavy. You don't have to have a doctor tell you that it is heavy. If you have to bring a change of clothes, if you're worried about leaking through your pad, that's heavy. Any definition you have where you think it's too much is okay. Um, and I, I think that, you know, really it's just, it's sort of that normalization that we go through as women to say, oh, this is how my period's always been. You know, I guess this is normal for me. It doesn't have to be. If you feel like your period is preventing you from doing the things you want to do, then you should seek help and, you know, don't take no for an answer. You know, I always tell people like, go for that second or third opinion. If you feel like you're not being taken seriously or you are not getting the answers that you're after, um, certainly continue to see people um, until you feel like all of your questions have been satisfactorily answered. Because when we look at the literature, we see that on average, women wait almost four years before they seek treatment. That's four years where they're missing work, missing school, or not able to go as far in work or school as they ordinarily would have because of their period. One third of women actually wait longer than five years. And that's a really long time to be bringing an extra pair of clothes to work. Um, a lot of people, almost half, see two or more healthcare providers for a diagnosis. Some of this is good, right? It's good to get a second opinion. It's good to fight for the information. But it also makes me kind of bummed out to say that you can't get the right answer or an answer that's satisfactory to you with just seeing one person. So really look at who you're seeing. Maybe the person who delivered your baby or who does your pap smears every year isn't the same person who can treat your fibroids with all of the newest technology. So there are people like me who specialize in fibroid treatment. I don't deliver babies. I don't do annual exams. I see people with fibroids every single day. And that is the only surgery that I do. So really, it's sometimes seeing someone who is a specialist in fibroid care, rather than seeing a general OBGYN, where you can cut down the number of people who are not going to give you all of the options. So how do we diagnose fibroids? Now that we know a little bit about them, how do we know that we have them? Well, if you don't know if you have them, you first need to start with a pelvic exam. This is like your routine annual exam at your doctor's office. What they should be doing is feeling the size and shape of your uterus to see if it's enlarged. If your uterus is enlarged, you may have uterine fibroids and that is confirmed with further testing. So that's really the first sort of defense 
against knowing whether you have a fibroid, but you might have smaller fibroids that are not felt on exam. So sometimes people have a normal pelvic exam, but they get diagnosed with other testing. So your doctor may order a pregnancy test because obviously if you have abnormal bleeding, we want to make sure that it's not due to pregnancy. They also may be screening for anemia, which is low blood counts. If your periods are super heavy, that would be a reason to order that testing. And then obviously we do want to make sure that there's no concern for cancer. So your doctor may order additional tests that might include a pap smear, might include a uterine biopsy. Those are ways that we test for cancer and assure ourselves that the bleeding is just due to fibroids and not something more concerning. And then finally, imaging is really the best way to confirm whether someone has fibroids before surgery. Usually it's an ultrasound, but if we are doing surgery, sometimes we recommend getting an MRI, which gives us a more detailed look at the uterus. So an ultrasound is a great screening test, but an MRI is like a high def TV. It gives us a much better picture about how many fibroids you have and where exactly they're located. So sometimes we'll start with an ultrasound and then ultimately recommend an MRI to confirm or to get better pictures. So now that we know we have fibroids, we're looking at different forms of treatment. And really this is the discussion that I have with each patient who comes to see me with fibroids. We go over what is your goal for the treatment? Are you looking to preserve your uterus? Is your top priority to get rid of your symptoms? Is your top priority fertility or pregnancy? How worried are you about cancer or, fi or fibroids coming back? How worried are you about other things like ovarian problems or you know, other types of issues in your pelvis? And then if you are thinking about surgery, how worried are you about how invasive the surgery is or how long your recovery time is? And that helps us triage these different treatment options, which we'll go through one by one today. There are some treatments that are not recommended. So these are because either we have studies that show that they are harmful, or we don't have studies that show they're beneficial. So those are things like certain medications, which are available in other countries, or herbal supplements. We unfortunately don't have a lot of good data about a lot of herbal supplements. There's some data about some teas and about some hormonal herbs that can change the way our body processes uh, hormonal um, balances, but you know, really we don't have very good studies in the same way that we've studied certain medications. All right, so let's talk about some treatments. That list of treatments is kind of overwhelming for a lot of people, so I like to break it down into three different categories. The first thing to think about is removing the uterus or not, right? So the first treatment decision is how do I feel about my uterus? If we're okay removing the uterus, then one of the treatment options that we talk about is a hysterectomy. That's where we remove the uterus, generally through small laparoscopic or robotic incisions, and we remove the uterus with all the fibroids intact. So in that way, we are preventing future fibroids from ever growing, and we completely eliminate having a period. So for people who don't mind losing their uterus and want their period to be completely gone, never want to worry about fibroids again, hysterectomy is not a crazy choice. With a hysterectomy, we do not remove the ovaries. That's a very common question that I get. So you do not go through hormone changes when you have your uterus removed. The only thing that changes is that you don't have a period anymore. You can't grow fibroids anymore, but your hormones stay the same as long as your ovaries are left alone. Your ovaries are what produce your hormones. So as long as we leave those in place, you don't have to take hormone therapy or any kind of hormone replacement afterwards. If you prefer to keep the uterus, then I think about three different categories of, you know, sort of fibroid treatment, fibroid shrinkage or fibroid removal. And then there's the third category, which does neither. So that category includes medications or endometrial ablation. What these two things do is really treat bleeding. They don't treat fibroids. So a lot of people ask me, can I take medications instead of doing surgery? And you absolutely can, but the medications will not make the fibroids go away. And most of them will barely shrink the fibroids. There are some medications that can decrease the size of fibroids, but they're not meant for long-term use. So a lot of the medications we use are hormonal medications to really treat your period bleeding. 
And that is great for some people. That's the main symptom they have. And that's what they're trying to do. So it's not that medications are a bad thing. It's just that they're not treating the fibroids themselves. And that's just something to be aware of. The same thing is true for uterine or endometrial ablation. That's very different than fibroid ablation because in endometrial ablation, we are treating the uterus itself. We're actually destroying or burning the lining of the uterus, which means that there's going to be less bleeding during your period, but we haven't actually treated the fibroids themselves. This is very different from fibroid ablation, which is a fibroid shrinkage procedure. So that's this column here on the left side. Fibroid shrinkage procedures are radiofrequency fibroid ablation. Sonata is one of those choices. Excessa is the other type of fibroid ablation. Excessa is done abdominally. So there needs to be abdominal incisions and the recovery is a little bit longer. Whereas Sonata is incisionless. It's com done completely vaginally and um, the recovery time is much shorter. So again, we'll talk about some of those differences when we talk about Sonata in a little bit more depth later. But just to go forward with some other fibroid shrinkage procedures, there's fibroid embolization, which is done by radiology, in which we decrease the blood flow to the fibroid. And then MRI-guided focused ultrasound, which is, as it sounds, you're in an MRI machine and an ultrasound wave is passed into the fibroid tissue to destroy the fibroids. The nice thing about these fibroid shrinkage procedures is that they have a very short recovery time. So for all of these procedures, there's either very small incisions or no incisions, and the recovery time is seven days or less. The nice thing about these two is that it decreases fibroid size and decreases fibroid-related bleeding. So it treats both the fibroid and the bleeding symptoms. And then in the middle here is fibroid removal. That's the procedure where we're actually taking fibroids out of the uterus and preserving the uterus itself. This is really the best choice for people who are actively trying to get pregnant or have had pregnancy difficulties in many cases. Um, obviously, this whole discussion is sort of a case-by-case -case basis. The main downside of the fibroid removal or myomectomy is that it often is more invasive than any of these procedures here, even hysterectomy. Because with myomectomy, we have to make an incision in the uterus for every fibroid that person has. So generally, people have three to 10 fibroids, which means three to 10 incisions on their uterus. So it's actually more invasive than the hysterectomy. It takes more time. There's more blood loss. There's more chance for complications like infection, prolonged anesthesia time, et cetera. So while it sounds like a great treatment, I get to remove the fibroids, preserve the uterus. It tends to unfortunately be the most invasive, which has the longest recovery time, about four to six weeks. Um, and sometimes it has to be done through a larger incision, like a C-section type of incision or a large up and down incision, depending on how many fibroids you have and how big they are. So this is the way I sort of categorize the treatments. First, preserving the uterus or not, and then shrinking the fibroids versus removing them. So when we think about, you know, why people come and see me or, you know, when I think about it, um, most of the people tell me, I, you know, saw my doctor, they wanted to do a hysterectomy or, you know, they just talked about hysterectomy and I, I just, I'm not, I don't feel ready for that. I'm not trying to have children, but I just, I feel like that's a really drastic measure. And this is actually borne out in the studies um, that have been done. So when we poll women nationally across this country, half of the women who responded to that survey said, yeah, I would want to preserve my uterus. And then a large proportion, 80%, said, not only do I want to preserve my uterus, but I actually want a less invasive procedure to treat uterine fibroids. And that's where we get into Sonata, or the medical phrasing, is a transcervical radiofrequency fibroid ablation. So we're going to take that big uh, uh, sentence and break it down. Transcervical means that it's incisionless. It means it goes through the vagina. So there's no cutting in the abdomen at all. Radiofrequency means that it is heating the fibroid tissue up very hot, basically melting the fibroid tissue. And that's the ablation part of it. So it's very specific fibroid targeted treatment, which means that we're preserving the uterus and we're only treating the fibroids. So we're not um, having to worry about destruction to other parts of the uterus or treating something that doesn't need to be treated. 
The coagulative necrosis is really the medical way to refer to that sort of melting of the tissue. It's actually killing the fibroid tissue so that it doesn't continue to grow and actually starts to shrink. Because it's an outpatient, because it's an incisionless procedure, it's an outpatient procedure. Um, it has a recovery time of just one or two days. And we'll go into what the recovery looks like a little bit more in detail. But before we do that, I want to show you what the device actually looks like. So this part's in the operating room. On the right side of the screen, you'll just see this ultrasound screen, which is what I see to guide the treatment. And then the generator for that ablation or that radio frequency power. This is the actual handpiece. Only a small portion is actually the portion that goes inside the uterus. So this very tip of it is what uh, deploys the active part of the instrument into the fibroid tissue. This other part of the handpiece incorporates an ultrasound. So I can see continuously during the surgery and also employs the, um, the sort of the, the um, toggles for the radio frequency portion of the procedure. So I can plan out where the ablation is going to take place. So this is a, a short video to show you what that actually looks like uh, when we are um, in surgery. The innovative Sonata system combines real-time intrauterine ultrasound with radio frequency energy to provide an incisionless, uterus-preserving treatment for women with symptomatic uterine fibroids. The Sonata treatment... All right, so what I'm going to do is actually just narrate this myself. Um, the ultrasound and sonata probe go into the uterus, as you can see. There is a small radio frequency array that comes out of the tip of the ultrasound and goes into the fibroid tissue. And that allows us to actually target the fibroid tissue itself and not the rest of the uterus. So what you'll see here is now a smart overlay. Those are the toggles on the handpiece that we were talking about. And that allows me to target that exact tissue using the ultrasound as a guide. So on the left lower part of the screen, you'll actually see the ultrasound image that I would see during surgery. I then make sure that the overlay lines up with the fibroid. I deploy the array into the fibroid tissue and then use the toggles on the handpiece, which you can see on the right hand side of the video, to make sure that the overlay is completely over the fibroid and nothing else important and then activate to, to start the um, deployment of heat or energy to the tissue. What I love about this procedure is that it's under direct and continuous visualization at all times, which means that I can check and double check throughout the procedure that I'm ablating the tissue that I want to and not ablating anything that I don't want to. So it's very safe. None of this procedure is blind, which, you know, makes makes it so that I can ensure um, safety during the entire procedure. Once the ablation cycle is done, it usually takes a couple of minutes, the device is repositioned, and over time the fibroid shrinks down and gets reabsorbed into the uterus. And so we'll talk about what that looks like. Okay. So a lot of people ask me, how well does this work, right? Like, I'm going to go through all of this, you know, is it worth the trouble? Um, well, we do see that in the studies that um, being absent from work does decrease from 3% to 1.5%. So by half, so 50% of the people who are having to call out of work because of their period are now not having to call out of work. We also see that impairment due to fibroids decreases from 50% to 12% and for work and nearly 60% to 14% for physical activity. So we can see that for work and for play, people are getting significant improvement in their symptoms, so much so that they feel like they can go back to work, they can go back exercising, they can do all the things they wanna do. Um, and that's what we call functional improvement. That's what we're looking for when we look for you know, outcomes in studies.
like it doesn't matter if your bleeding decreases from like 65 milliliters to 60 milliliters because number one who measures how much their period is and number two that's not like a functional metric right like you want to just go back to work you want to go out to dinner with your friends you want to exercise and those are the outcomes that we're looking for so in this study most importantly they looked at those functional outcomes and this showed that getting to work going to exercise those things people were able to do again and importantly, in these studies, no late complications occurred. So remember, in that video, what you're seeing is that that ablation is taking place under direct visualization at all times. I can see where the energy is going throughout the entire surgery, which means it's a very safe procedure where there's unlikely to be something that goes wrong without me knowing about it. And that's what we see in the studies is that there weren't any late complications like injury to the colon or injury to the bladder, you know, injury to surrounding things didn't happen because we were able to see during the entire surgery. In these studies, what we see is that the, a large proportion, nearly 100%, uh, reduce uh, their period bleeding. And this is within three to 12 months. So what I tell patients is that we're not looking for no period, right? This is not a hysterectomy where your periods go away, but we're looking for a more quote unquote normal period. And generally that starts to happen in the first month after surgery and improves month by month until month three. At month three, that's basically your new baseline. So your bleeding gets better and better and better. And then at three months, that's probably, you know, the bleeding that you should expect moving forward. But really great about this technology is that it actually reduces fibroid size as well as your bleeding. So remember, we talked about some of those treatments that only reduce your bleeding. But this is a treatment that reduces bleeding plus fibroid size, and it actually reduces it pretty substantially. So by about 55 to 60 percent, again, in the first three months. So in that first three months, the fibroids are getting smaller and smaller. And then by month three, they kind of stabilize in size. You might see them on an ultrasound. I always tell patients, if you get an ultrasound for another reason, you might see sort of the ghost of the fibroid. That's almost like a scar of where the fibroid was. It doesn't mean you need more treatment. If your symptoms are great, you don't have to do anything about that. At three years, 88% said their symptoms were still diminished um, and they didn't have any concerns about their fibroids. And they 94% were satisfied at three years. Um, and again, you know, this brings us back to Jackie's story and other patients where we're not just looking at the first three months after treatment. We want to know at three years, at five years, you know, are you still doing OK? Because we don't want to have to go back and do another procedure next year. We want to make sure that this is durable treatment. So over 90 percent of people report that they're still satisfied at three years and they have not had more treatments for their fibroid symptoms. So I don't know about you, but if I got a 95 on a test and a 90 on a test, I'd be really happy with that. But actually, that's also very good when we compare it to the other treatments. So Sonata performs very well on its own, but it even performs better than all the other treatments that we have for fibroids. So we did talk about there are two types of radiofrequency or fibroid ablation um, procedures. There's the laparoscopic, which is the excessa, and transcervical or vaginal, which is Sonata. The laparoscopic one is not as great for a couple of reasons. Obviously, you have to have incisions. The recovery time is longer. So that's not ideal. But also, the reintervention rate is higher. So if you look over at this right side of this chart, the Sonata or transcervical ablation has the lowest reintervention rate at three years, which means that had the fewest number of people needing more treatments for their fibroid symptoms at three years. So again, over 90% of people were doing just fine and didn't need to do anything else. For all the other procedures, laparoscopic ablation, myomectomy, fibroid embolization, and MRI-guided focused ultrasound, the reintervention rate is higher, which means those people, 11% up to 34%, got that treatment and then ended up needing to get something else within three years. So I think that's a really important metric when you're deciding about what kind of treatment is how open are you to needing another treatment in the future? Do you want to be in the 8% group or in the 34% group? You know, obviously the lower the chance of reintervention, the better. All right. So if you decided to have Sonata, this is what we would talk about what to expect 
after the surgery. The procedure itself may take about an hour. You're asleep the whole time under anesthesia, so you won't have any pain or awareness. The actual amount of time in surgery really depends on how many fibroids we have to treat. Obviously, if there are a lot of fibroids or really big fibroids, the treatment time might be longer. If you have smaller fibroids or very few fibroids, the treatment time is less. Um, after the surgery, when you wake up in the recovery room, you might have a little bit of spotting or cramping that usually lasts for a couple of days, usually no longer than a couple of weeks. Sometimes people might pass little bits of tissue as the fibroid sort of breaks down and dies. Um, you're actually going to pass a small amount of fibroid tissue, which I tell people is a great thing. That means the treatment was successful. The fibroid's dying. We're winning. Um, usually people just take Tylenol and ibuprofen. They usually alternate between the two of them every three to six hours for a couple of days. So the pain is very minimal compared to a lot of the other treatments where we're actually making incisions in the body. Usually you just take over-the-counter things like acetaminophen or Tylenol and ibuprofen or Advil. There are no physical activity restrictions. I don't require patients to have any lifting restrictions or to stop exercising. If you want to go home and exercise, you want to go home and you know go back to work, that's totally your choice. Usually people might take 24 to 48 hours off of work just for the anesthesia perspective. It's not that they have a lot of pain. It's just the anesthesia makes people feel kind of groggy. And so I have pa patients take off about one or two days if they work outside the home but there's no physical or activity restrictions. Um, the only thing I do ask patients to do, and this is personal, is just pelvic rest for seven to 10 days. That means nothing in the vagina, no tub baths, swimming pools, vaginal sex, or tampons. That's, again, you know, every doctor might have their own um, sort of recommendations, but I do think this decreases the risk for pelvic infection. Um, and so uh, I do ask patients to wait about a week before returning to any water activities or any vaginal intercourse. After about one to three months, you would definitely not have any more surgical pain. And again, your bleeding and fibroid size would start to decrease within one month and get better at two and get better at three months. So you'll just see this sort of gradual improvement over the course of one to three months. I will call patients within two days after surgery just to check in, make sure you're feeling okay, because by two days, you really should be back to your normal self. And then I tell people, no news is good news. If you're feeling great, you don't need to see me again. But if you do have concerns at that three-month mark where we are expecting things to be better, please do come and see me. Because while this treatment works for over 90% of patients, it doesn't mean it works for 100% of patients. And so if you're that one unlucky person in 10 that might have some ongoing symptoms that need treatment, please come back and see me and we'll talk about what to do next. So one of the biggest questions I get is pregnancy. You know, I still have my uterus. Is it okay if I get pregnant? And really the sort of labeling behind this, um, all of the studies show that pregnancy is not contraindicated, meaning if you got pregnant, we would still take care of you and, you know, that's okay. So wanting to get pregnant is not a reason that you shouldn't or can't have the Sonata procedure. Um, it does just mean that we don't have a lot of information because it is a relatively new technology that was designed in the past few years. So it means that while we don't see it as a reason to not get pregnant, we can't tell you what might happen if you did get pregnant. Because since Sonata has been around, there have been 89 pregnancies that have occurred. Those pregnancies resulted in 55 deliveries, and the people with Sonata had the same outcomes as the people who never had Sonata. So that's actually really good. It means that having Sonata didn't decrease their chance of getting pregnant, didn't increase the chance of pregnancy loss, or didn't affect their child after the child was born. In fact, a lot of these women had vaginal deliveries, which wouldn't be the case had they had a different treatment like myomectomy, where often people are, are recommended to have a C-section instead of a vaginal delivery. So I think, you know, if you were to ask me to read my crystal ball in 10 years, once we have a lot of people who've gotten pregnant after Sonata, this is probably going to be really the recommended course of treatment because we're not actually cutting into the uterus or disrupting the uterus in any way. And that allows people to still have a functional pregnancy and a vaginal delivery afterwards. But right now, because we don't have all of those um, years of history, we are looking at 89 pregnancies. And so I tell people the data we have is very reassuring. Those people who got pregnant did really well. They actually did just as well as people who never had Sonata, but we just don't have a lot of them, right? 89 pregnancies, not the same as 100,000 pregnancies to say, this is what could happen to you. 
Um, so, you know, this is something that I would talk to your doctor about. It might depend on where your fibroids are located, how big they are. That could also affect their decision for recommending Sonata or not. There are a couple reasons why Sonata wouldn't be the right choice. So if your doctor or you have concerns about a uterine cancer, there should be some additional testing done to sort of assess for that. And depending on the results of that testing, if there's a high suspicion for cancer, this is not a cancer treatment, right? This is a treatment for uterine fibroids, which are not cancerous. If you have any metal implants in the pelvis area, so things like a hip replacement, hardware in your lower spine, unfortunately, the devices interact with those metal implants. So this is not a treatment that you can receive safely. So you should tell your doctor about any implants that you have in your body. Anything that is below the hips, so knee replacement or above the hips, like a pacemaker, totally fine. Um, you just don't want anything in the area where your fibroids are because that's where the treatment is being done. And then there are some softer, you know, things to consider. These aren't absolute reasons not to do Sonata, but it's something that your doctor may talk to you about. So we talked about fibroid location. If your fibroids are located more on the surface of your uterus, they're harder for the Sonata to reach. So you might not be the best candidate for that treatment. Fibroids that are more located towards the center of the uterus that cause the, the heavy period bleeding, the painful period bleeding, those are the fibroids where Sonata is able to make the most impact. And then really big fibroids might not respond well to Sonata. So above 10 centimeters, it becomes harder and harder for us to ablate all of that fibroid tissue. And that's where doing a different treatment might be a better option. So these are things to talk to your doctor about if you're thinking about Sonata. And I just want to conclude with the fact that like knowledge is power, right? That's why we're all here tonight. That's why we wanted to deliver this presentation to you is you should know what your options are. Um, and choosing between the different fibroid treatments is about knowing what your priorities are and then the things that worry you. And that's what I help people decide when they come and see me is I ask them, what are your priorities? What are your goals for treatment? And what are the things that really worry you? And that helps us go through that decision tree for different kinds of treatments. If you're someone who wants to preserve the uterus, there's low risk for cancer, you have you know, concerns about a long recovery time, Sonata is a great treatment, right? No incisions, fast recovery time, preserves the uterus, addresses bleeding, and some of those painful, bulky symptoms. So it's just about knowing that there are different options and seeing a fibroid specialist to ensure that you're given access to all of those options, or at least a discussion for it. Um, I would just like to end about where you can find your doctors. So if you go to sonatatreatment.com, the find a doctor is right on the top um, toolbar and you can put in your zip code and find a provider that's in your area. Um, certainly we do take consults at Mayo Clinic for people who are out of state as well. So if you can't find one close to you um, or you have additional questions, I'm also happy to see you in that, um, you know, in that perspective. Um, so now we have some time for some question and answers. I see some stuff in the chat, so that's great. Thank you guys for contributing. I'm going to stop sharing so we can have a face-to-face -face conversation. And um, I'll let Teresa and Casey run the chat. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Louie, for that. Uh, a lot of information that you communicated. Very well done. Thank you. We have a, we have a few questions. One is... How can I prevent the fibroids from returning after the treatment? That's a great question. I, I get that one a lot because now that we've treated all the fibroids, people don't want them to come back. Um, and as we talked about, as long as there's a uterus, unfortunately, there's the possibility that fibroids could return, right? So anything but a hysterectomy does leave us open to the possibility of developing new fibroids. Um, the fibroids we treat are unlikely to get bigger, right? Once they've been ablated by the, the Sonata technology, they're unlikely to grow back, but you could develop new ones. This becomes less likely as we get older. So if you're you know, 40 and above, your chance of developing new fibroids is like 10% compared to someone who's younger than 40, where their risk is like 20 to 50%, right? So age plays a big role in that. Sometimes just getting older is a benefit and decreases our risk for fibroid recurrence. 
Um, other things you can do, as we talked about in the beginning, is live a healthy lifestyle. So I talk to people about, you know, maintaining exercise to have a healthy weight and then using that Mediterranean or whole food diet, less processed foods, more fruits and vegetables, and then controlling any of those other medical conditions. Because remember, high blood pressure, diabetes, and being overweight are associated with fibroid growth. So if you have high blood pressure or diabetes, getting good control of those conditions helps to decrease your risk for further fibroid growth. There are also some medications that can decrease your chance of fibroid growth. Progestin therapy, which is a type of hormone, can decrease the risk for fibroids. So that's found in birth control pills or the Depo-Provera injection. So sometimes your doctor may be able to prescribe those medications if you're looking for some form of birth control in addition to preventing fibroid growth. Okay, great. Got another question. This particular woman has had a couple of IUDs for now for heavy periods. Can you have this procedure with an IUD? Yes. So what we would do is if you wanted to do the Sonata, we would take out your old IUD while you're under anesthesia. We would do the Sonata treatment and then replace a new IUD. So we don't do the Sonata with the IUD in place because obviously it has metal in it and we don't want to interfere with the device. So we just take the old one out and put a new one in, but we do that while you're asleep. So you don't have to go through that removal and replacement like you did when you were awake. Um, and that's great. You know, doing the IUD is another way to, you know, protect against um, pregnancy, but also control your period even after the Sonata has been done. So I, I think about it as like belt and suspenders. The Sonata is great for treating your bleeding. The IUD is great for your bleeding. And both of those combined give you a really good result. Another question. How long after the first Sonata treatment can it be done again? If you do need it to be done again, we usually wait at least that three months because remember, we're expecting to see improvement up until that three month mark. If you still have symptoms at three months, we do ask people to come back in. We might do another ultrasound or MRI to see if the fibroids have been adequately treated. And then we could do the Sonata treatment again or talk about some other treatments. Sometimes by that point, if people have not responded well to the Sonata, they might be thinking about some other treatments. It sort of just depends on what that ultrasound shows us and how the first procedure went. If your fibroids were really big and they shrunk but not enough, then sometimes we do repeat the ablation. It just sort of depends on what that specific clinical scenario is. But I would say at least three months and sometimes even up to six months, we're still going to see improvements. So I would give it that time. If it's still, you know, causing a lot of issues with work or school, sometimes we prescribe medications in the interim while the person is, you know, sort of experiencing those symptoms and allowing the fibroids to shrink. So if people are open to being on medications, sometimes we do the procedure, we stay on medications for three months, and then we stop the medications and see how they do afterwards. So that just helps us control during that waiting period where they're waiting for the fibroids to shrink. But we actually do see improvement within that first month. It's just that the best level of improvement is by three to six months. Perfect. Um... Another question. A couple of thank yous. This was very informative. Uh, but there's another woman who says she's looking at other options. So that's great. Um, there's one about, let me go back up here. Um, Will menopause affect the bleeding associated with the fibroid? Yes, a lot of people ask me about what happens with their fibroids and menopause. And they say, you know, my doctor tells me that everything's going to go away if I go into menopause. Do I really need this treatment? You know, I'm 49. Um, and, you know, while bleeding may go away with menopause, the fibroids don't. So I always tell people it's really important to know what goes away and what doesn't. When you go through menopause, your ovaries stop producing estrogen and your periods stop. So menopause is defined as having no period for a year. So yes, if you have bleeding symptoms with fibroids, they should go away when you hit menopause. But there are a couple of exceptions. The fibroid does not go away. So if they're really big fibroids and you're having some of the pressure symptoms on your bladder, on your colon, if you're feeling heaviness or weight from the fibroids, that's not going to get better. Menopause does not make the fibroids disappear or dissolve. So, you know, some people do actually continue to need treatment for their fibroids even after menopause for those bulky symptoms, the heaviness of them. 
And then sometimes people go on menopause hormone therapy. So that's the second caveat is if you're on menopause hormone therapy, you are reversing that natural decline in estrogen. And we did talk about the fact that fibroids are responsive to estrogen. So if you're taking estrogen supplements, pills, patch, vaginal ring, pellets, the whole, any form of estrogen, you could have continued fibroid growth after menopause. So if I have a person who's having problems with their fibroids in their 40s, I say, you know, you could wait till menopause, but if you're ever going to be on menopause therapy or you have bulkiness from your fibroids, those things are going to be problems for you even after you cross over the menopause threshold. And it might be easier to get a treatment now when you're in your 40s than when you're in your 50s, just from a recovery and anesthesia standpoint. So some people do treat their fibroids prophylactically. Their symptoms are a bit mild, but they just don't want them to get any worse or they don't want to have to worry about fibroid growth when they're in their 50s or 60s. Um, one patient stated that her gynecologist told her that fibroids would go would go away with menopause. Yeah, I know. I get a lot of patients who tell me that, you know, they come in, they're like 50 years old and they have fibroids. They're like, ah, I just kind of thought they'd go away. And your period goes away, but the fibroids don't, right? So the fibroids are like, you know, their growths in your uterus and they don't just dissolve because we, you know, turn 50 or our periods turned off. If your only symptom is bleeding, for sure, you can wait for menopause to wait it out. But those are those two caveats is if your bleeding is not the only symptom. And if you ever were to be on hormone therapy, those are two reasons I would suggest, you know, thinking about fibroid treatment, even if you are close to menopause. Menopause is also difficult to predict. For some of us, it happens at 45. And for some of us, it happens at 55. So there's a huge range there. You might not want to suffer with fibroid symptoms for the next 10 years, hoping that every year is going to be the year that it happens to you. You know, there's not a crystal ball for us to know when menopause is going to happen to us. So, you know, even if your doctor does blood testing, even if you have salivary testing, that's not predictive. Blood tests only tell you what your hormones are doing to you right now. It doesn't tell you that menopause is going to happen in one month or six months or 12 months. So, you know, what I tell someone who's 49 is, yeah, menopause could happen next year. It could also happen five years from now. You know, how, how much do you want to spend worrying about your period? Good information. Can you have this procedure, can you have this procedure done if you have fibroids in the lining of your uterus? Yes. I think those people are the you know, sort of top candidates for this procedure. So when we have fibroids in the lining of our uterus, generally we're talking about submucosal fibroids or fibroids inside the womb or cavity. And those fibroids can be removed vaginally and ablated vaginally. So I often do a combined procedure because I want my patients to get the best results, right? So I want to remove as much of the fibroid as I can and then do sonata or ablation of the fibroid, any fibroid that remains. So remember, fibroids can be really big. And sometimes we can't remove all of it. So a lot of times we do these combined procedures where there's stages. There's the fibroid ablation stage and then a fibroid removal stage to ensure that we're treating the entire fibroid. So that's why, again, going to a fibroid specialist might get you some of these more nuanced treatments where you're getting combinations of things to ensure that you have the best outcome and not just someone who's you know doing half of it and then you have to go back for the other half later. You want to be able to get the most bang for your buck and you know get treated um, with as many procedures as you might need under that one dose of anesthesia. So yes, but ablation is great for fibroids in the lining of your uterus, but it may need to be combined with another minor procedure. Doesn't elongate your recovery at all, doesn't increase the risk of the surgery at all, just gives you a better outcome. So that's where talking to your doctor about making sure we, you know, treat all of the fibroid or get the best possible, you know, uh, result is really important. Great, great. Um, an additional question. One of my fibroids is the size of, size of a grapefruit. Am I a good candidate for Sonata? Yeah, you can still do uh, the Sonata treatment. A grapefruit generally means that it's probably about six or seven centimeters. You know, it's on the bigger side of things for sure. But again, that's why I would talk to a fibroid specialist to make sure that, you know, we're choosing the right procedure. Depends on the kind of symptoms you have. It depends on what your goals are. 
Um, you know, as we get bigger, you know, bigger than 10 centimeters, which is, you know, I would say a really big grapefruit or, you know, more like cantaloupe size, then we're talking about, you know, maybe the Sonata wouldn't be as effective. Doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means that you might need multiple treatments or you might need, you know, a combined treatment, Sonata plus something else. So that's where, you know, looking at your scans and, you know, looking at your symptoms becomes that sort of um, treatment planning. Okay, great. And lastly, will this webinar or slides be available afterwards? I'm happy to make them available. I, I, I know that this is being recorded. And so I think that, um, you know, that we can make it available to people. Certainly, I think that's a that's a question for Casey, though. It's above my pay grade. Perfect. Yes, absolutely. Yes, um, we are recording this webinar, so we will make sure it gets sent out to everybody. Um, so you all will have access. Perfect. Well, just to wrap things up, Dr. Louie, thank you for sharing your best practices, insights, and experiences with, with everyone. Um, ladies, if you'd like to schedule a consultation with Dr. Louie, her link is in the chat. Um, for those who um, uh, are looking for a physician in their area, you can go on the website, sonatatreatment.com. And uh, again, at that top bar, it says find a physician. You could You could find a doctor in your area. Um, I also want to thank the ladies for taking the time to, to learn more about their options and the Sonata treatment, and also thank you for joining us. And on behalf of Gynosonics, everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Please reach out if you have any questions or we can help at all. Enjoy your evening, everyone. Take care. Thank you.